happiness, it is definitely not the same as nothingness. But you know that I've harped on that a lot in the earlier classes. Most of you have been here in earlier classes. And actually it comes, the, 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 ver, the word, the noun shunyata, comes from a verb root in Sanskrit, shvi, which is cognate with the verb in English to swell. Like when a seed is moistened and it swells and then there's an empty space inside it. So it's the moistening of something and then it swells up. So that's where the word emptiness comes from. Swellingness, it means, like openness, actually. It's maybe almost the best translation for it. Not to confuse it with uh, openness. Not to con Thank you, William. Not to confuse it with, um, um, you know, with nothingness, which it was confused in Asia with nothingness often. And um, so now Shantideva, he begins with this thing in verse, uh, around in the 60s, verse 60s. He refutes personal identity. Oh, so, oh yeah, so shunyata, so that's emptiness. Then karuna, the karu is kind of connects with the heart. And um, karu can mean pleasure also. And na means not as a negation. So the sort of uh, meaning etymology of karuna, the word for compassion, it connects to a word for the trembling heart, a, a quivering heart. But it also means stopping happiness, meaning that compassion means you move out of your own sense of happiness to embrace the suffering of another. I mean, that's basically what it means. So what is, this is very interesting. So shunyata karna being the same thing, wisdom and compassion being the same thing, in a way, wisdom of emptiness being compassion as the same thing, ultimately. Uh, it has to do with the fact that when you experience emptiness, and you can't do that by thinking of some empty space or of nothingness, etc., although if you think of that, you, it, you are inclined toward nihilism. It's considered a bad idea. So what, the only way you can discover emptiness is by looking for something that you think is not empty. And so, let me, let's, let's rehearse that right now and right away and do a meditation, every one of you. Very advanced one, we'll do it right away. Okay? So go into meditative mode, the best way they've been describing it. Go into meditative mode, which this means you don't have to sit cross-legged on the floor because we don't have pillows, but just cross your ankles, hold your hand, and you know, sit up straight, etc. You know, eyes half open is the Indian and Tibetan way. And... Um, so that you're kind of bored about your visual field, so that you can go deeper into your mind than just being a reaction to your visual object. Right? So you don't close it to go off into fantasy, and you don't open it to be confronting visual objects. You leave it half open, your eyes. OK. So now, and now this is really going to be compressed. So now you remember a time when you were deeply upset and of a particular type of being deeply upset where someone dear to you, ideally, but it could be just anybody, if you can't remember such a, an occasion with someone dear to you, someone dear to you falsely accused you of doing some wrong thing, which you actually innocent of having done. And this is a little tricky you have to, as you remember this episode where you were feeling injured innocence, hurt feelings in that sense, it's, a, it's on a curve. If you make a curve between somebody falsely accusing you, <clears throat> you feeling innocent, so you sort of feel righteous, but then you also feel wounded that they would think you would have done whatever they accused you of. How could they think that, you know, type of thing. And that's the best place right there, injured innocence. And then if you make a curve, if they keep doing it, you protest your innocence vehemently or softly and vehemently. And then if they don't listen and they keep accusing you, you become indignant and righteously so, strongly indignant. And then if they keep on doing it, then you'll become angry if you can remember such an episode. And, uh, and you get mad that they would insist on doing this when you 
when you, when you have protested your innocence and your image of yourself is such, a t such that you wouldn't do this and actually you hadn't done it in this case. So actually you're supposed to spend a few months just meditating on this. <laughs> but the trick of it is, is that you try to relive the memory. In other words, your remembering aspect of your consciousness should be like the, someone who's witnessing something from a hiding place. So you make it a small part of your consciousness. It's conceptual, you have to divide your consciousness this way. And the main part of your consciousness, like you were a method actor or something, goes to inhabit how you felt during the episode. And you try to go back to find the moment of most righteously injured innocence w from which you want to rise up as a, I did not, I would not, I never, you know, this kind of strong thing like that. Okay? So just reflect like that for a minute and, and get out of being the one who's reflecting and try to relive the episode. And you know that why you need to take more time with it is you need to feel the emotions and you need to feel the sort of feeling of like a con constricted solar plexus and like something in your throat, lump in your throat maybe, feeling of constriction maybe in the throat, tightness in your throat. You know, often in the movies when the hero is framed and they try to protest their innocence, they're sort of tongue-tied you know, they, and you get frustrated that they're not, hey, they get, tell them your alibi. And the guy's stammering, you know, and then they're hauling him off to the gallows, you know. You know that, that thing that happened in movies. So, so uh, you want to you relive this feeling of being injured innocent. When you really strongly feel it after some time, which we only can imagine now in this meditation, when you strongly feel that, you... Uh, you really do. You um, you then feel how solid your sense of that your pronoun I really lands somewhere. It has a real reference. You hear that Buddha says there's no self. You hear that Vedanta says that this small self of the individual is not your real true self. You know, various you know, people, materialists, of course, reject the idea that a sense of self is anything, uh, even in their nihilism. And so all of these things, you know, you, but, but you don't do that. You first admit to yourself that you really feel like you are a self, like you're here, you're there, you were there, you're in, you're, and, and this comes out fully, strongly assertion of your sense of individuality of experiential individuality comes out when you have this injured innocence and this righteousness. Because you feel that it's right that you assert your, that you didn't do this and that you're so and so, and et cetera, you know. You assert your identity, in other words. And you feel right, so you strongly do assert it. And when you strongly do assert it, you simultaneously think it's there to be asserted. So this is the first step of this meditation. And as I say, you can just imagine, basically, when you succeed in this first step of the meditation on personal selflessness, you come to where you admit that on some visceral level, you don't agree with these teachings about selflessness and emptiness. You don't agree with that. You feel that you ha you're full of being yourself. You're full of yourself. At some visceral level, you feel that. And even you feel that it's normal and it's correct to, to feel that way. So, so then you realize that Buddha knows that, that we feel that way. He felt that way about himself as well, stubbornly insisted on his path, etc. And therefore, when he says he has discovered selflessness, and that we are selfless. We lack such kind of solid, you know, substantially existent, intrinsically real self. 
you know, intrinsically referential self. Uh, that, um, therefore, when he says we lack that, he knows he's challenging us. He's posing a challenge. Then we may understand intellectually what he means, and then there our intellectual understanding it becomes into a state of being challenging, our visceral feeling. But we need to connect. It's like they say, selflessness is a negation. It's a refutation or a negation. So in order for you to understand a negation, you have to understand what is being negated. What is the self that is being negated? And so it isn't just the word self. It isn't even the being self-responsible in some interactivity way. But it's the feeling that there's an objective, intrinsically real, <coughs> intrinsically substantial self somewhere in the center of our being consciousness, we pretty quickly give up, give up that it would be in the center of the body. Although people will thump their chest, you know, so there may be a heart thing about it. And uh, this is, so, so, but, so this is identifying what is to be negated by the teaching or the reasoning of selflessness. Okay? Second step is somehow to agree to your, the way your conventional mind works. It's called the, the, the elimination of any third option, second key. And this one is where you say, OK, Buddha, you're challenging my gut sense of self. I get it. Uh, you and I don't agree. I agree with you intellectually, but viscerally, I don't agree with you. But I respect you enough and Nagarjuna and Tsongkhapa and Guru Rinpoche and whoever, the whole long tradition. I respect you guys enough that I take up your challenge and I will look, seek to verify in my viscera if indeed there is such a real, solid, substantial, intrinsically real, intrinsically identifiable self in there. So then the second step is in doing so, whatever happens, however I have, whatever experience I have, I will only allow myself to have two options on the convention. Because conventional level is a yes and no level. You know, it's a law of excluded middle level. And so either the self that I feel is there, I will discover it to be there objectively if I search with all my effort. Or I will fail to find it. And I won't make any third option. I won't sit endlessly in sort of doubt and hesitancy saying that, well, it might be there somewhere, but I didn't find it yet, but maybe I will later or something. In other words, or maybe it's there in some unfindable way or whatever it is. I won't indulge in any third option because after all, conventionally up or down, yes or no, right or left, red light or green light, you know, that's how a conventional mind practically works. And when you're supposed, you have to make that commitment uh, in this process, because when you go looking into yourself for your sense of solid self, for what underlies your sense of solid self, your mind will take you through many, contemplative mind will take you in many highways and byways into many strange states. And so you, ahead of time, say, I'm going to have a practical outcome to this investigation that I will undertake. So then the third. The third step, there's third and fourth step, there's third through seventh step, there's different steps. But the simplest, the third step is that, called the royal reason of relativity. Anyway, it's so simple, it may be too simple at first, so people kind of do it another way, and we'll look in Shantideva at another way in a minute. But the simplest thing is called the royal reason of relativity, and that means that if this self that I feel like is the real me inside in my gut, if it were there and it were something that was not dissolved under analysis, it was something that is objectively findable, it has like ultimacy, it has ultimate real, it's as real as my hand, it has a real existence and it doesn't change, it corresponds to the sense I have of myself that I'm always sort of me, 
And even though I know I change in some circumstances, but there's a kind of register, consciousness register in there that's always me, that always maintains a continuity. My voice seems to come from it, my inner voice. And um, if that were so, that it were there ultimately, then I, of course I can't find it because I can only find things that are relative. Actually, therefore, there can be no relevant ultimate thing in the center of my being that is sort of fixed, changed, absolute, ultimate, is the real thing. Because if it were really real, it, could, it would be, it would, and if it were absolute, it's the opposite of relative. And obviously, my sense of self relates to how I behave. I feel that when I go, I, it's, I'm referring to it, or I say, I'm Bob. So actually, I'm relating to something, even though I feel that, well, there's some absolute thing behind what I can actually touch. But still, even though I'd not, I can't verify it, I'm relating to it. Once I relate to it, it can't be absolute. Do you follow me? Something that's relative is infinitely divisible. There's no atom, there's no individual, undividable. Everything is made up of parts and components, and the more they go, like in quantum, you know, the more the subatomic particle becomes charms and quarks and bosons and all kinds of things. And they, it disappears under analysis, wave particle paradox, etc. Okay? So, so now I'm going to connect this to stay in meditative form. So that's the main thing. And of course, when you start looking at this sense of self, you, and Shantideva from in his verse 60s up to 70, he helps with reasonings that fit with your analysis and empower it, which are very good. But I'm not going to go into them in detail. I'm going to go where he comes to what are called the four, I call them foci, four focuses of mindfulness. He, they call, he calls it here in this one translation, of close placement of mindfulness on the body. And so this is where you have meditated looking for that self. You have embraced the royal reason of relativity. Whatever is relative cannot be absolute. Therefore, and relative things therefore are always interactive with other relative things. So therefore they are always changing. And when you really try to put your finger a point on some sort of relative thing, it constantly eludes your ability to pinpoint it. For example, you put a point on a sheet of paper, an XY place, but the point actually is not there because the, the dot that you make is not a point. So the actual perfect position of XY has no size, so it's really only an abstraction. Now that's, a, like those, that's a kind of example. So similarly, the point of you, the real you, you can't find. So you're a relative being. So when you do that, you have a, and when you do that in a very concentrated way, what happens is you kind of start spinning in the core of your consciousness, which do as a meditation, you sort of, in other words, you're looking for yourself, looking for yourself, looking for yourself. Because what happens is you kind of turn in your, in the, in the deepest place in your awareness that you can to look for the subjective register of the awareness. But when you do, you don't find anything. But then when you don't find it, you feel, well, that's because I'm like a dog chasing its tail. I have turned away from where I was looking. And I am doing the looking. So then again, you try to look back at yourself looking in the, in the core of your mind. And you will start being a whirling dervish. And it's very difficult to do. You have to have a good, strong concentration to do this. And you'll start kind of spinning. And when you spin like that, you sort of drill through. You eventually reach a kind of point of heat. You reach a point of centering strongly. You kind of drill through the seeming absolute subject touching the seeming absolute object of the self. So the subject self touching the object self but actually, you, they both drill through each other and they melt. And what happens when they melt is you have this relief. It's kind of agonizing if you do it real, real meditative intensity. It can be kind of agonizing. It's like it 
crunch right deep in your center of your awareness. And then it melts into a feeling of space because both points kind of dissolve and the subject-object duality starts to decline. And then there's an experience. It can be a kind of bursting experience. It can be a gradual experience of like melting into openness. And not, it's not, you don't have a feeling of yourself as a body because you're so deep in your mind, you're not, you have already rejected in a way of being aware of the body because you know that this sense of absolute object self and subject self is not physical in the normal course sense. And uh, you feel that melting that open space is like a freedom. And I'm always reminding you never to, t never to in case you have such a concentrative ability or at some point in the future you do this and you have that space like, it's called space like equipoised samadhi and samadhi means high intensity concentration. So a space-like equipoise samadhi. And so some people would think that's, some people wrongly think that's the realization of emptiness. But it isn't. It's simply the not finding of that non-empty absolute point of objective subjectivity or subjective objectivity. And you don't have to be a Buddhist to do this. If you read carefully Descartes, you will realize that just before he came up with I think, therefore I am, he realized that he couldn't find himself. He was in that sort of inner whirling as a deep meditator, and he couldn't find, he admitted that he couldn't find it. But then he tricked himself a little bit, and he said, well, I can't find it because I'm looking for it as an object, but obviously I'm a subject. So, you, I can never find myself as an object, but by the fact of looking, it means I'm absolutely there. And that was where he made the mistake. If he'd been con content to be a conventional relative subjectivity, he would have had completely the Buddhist insight. And he probably, and he did have the Buddhist experience of not being able to find the self, the coarse, ordinary self that he thought he was. But then he didn't, he didn't have the community, the knowledge, the mentor, to help him saying that, well, that failure to find and that acknowledgement that you're your mere subjectivity, then you should realize that that mere subjectivity is just purely relational to a whole variety of objects. And you can't, you should not make the mistake of thinking that subjectivity of yours is an absolute. Because if it is absolute, it would be irrelevant to you. It couldn't relate to you. It couldn't be your subjectivity which is very simple reasoning of relativity that he would have dig, he would have totally dug because he was logical minded. So we're just imagining that we're having a space-like experience now. But the key point is, they say space-like. So it's like everything becomes just open space. And what that is, is a failure to find this absolute solid subjectivity objectivity is all that is but then your probing investigating mind has a momentum in that space or should and also had a preparation that sort of would non-verbally be remembered and that momentum is well what is this space that I am now it isn't that just I am in it is I am this space what is this space that I am is this the real me and when you do that exploration, you sort of realize that space has up and down, left, right, it has direction. And temporally also, you can retrieve. When you're in it, you don't remember it right away, any sense of time. You have a temporarily timeless sense. But if you investigate it, you remember there was a boundary before you melted into the space when you were in this agonizingly sharp, one-pointed concentration. And so you realize there's a boundary between this spaciousness and your sense of the relational world. And when you realize that, you realize this space is not itself absolute either. It's a relational, and the experience of space is itself a relational experience. And when you realize that, the space, the, the space into which you disappeared sort of disappears and allows you to retrieve yourself 
as a relational entity in what is called the dreamlike or illusion-like aftermath samadhi. And of course, it's dreamlike or illusion-like and very powerfully so, depending on how deep your experience of disappearing was, of your, how deep your sustaining of the experience of failing to find a self. If you got so deep that you, the subject and the object looking for each other both sort of melted, then you were truly open. And actually, Tibetan psychology would say that at that point of being truly open, the subtle physiology of the central channel and the heart chakra and all this kind of thing, to deeply, most deeply understand that those things open, actually. And you understand that from a subtle mind place in the central channel. But they usually don't, when they deal with it purely philosophically and exoterically, they don't invoke that for a reason.